Mount Sinai, I'm excited to be able to share with you on this Thanksgiving message. Now please bow with me for a word of prayer. Dear Lord, please use me to speak your words so that we may grow closer to you and just get a better connection with you. In Jesus name we pray, amen. So let me start off by saying how immensely grateful I am for my Mount Sinai family. I mean, my spiritual foundation was firmly established by each and every one of you. From the Red Circle and Sunshine Band to the Junior Usher Board, I mean, you guys have inspired me to be exactly what I am today. That's why I still remember Philippians 4, 13. I remember putting in the offering and then reciting it every Saturday. So throughout the years, you all have been the most supportive community of faith that I have experienced. And I love you and I'm honored to be able to share with you on today. Now I promise you, I'll get to the scripture and explore it in great detail. But if you'd allow me a moment to break protocol from the typical sermon format and spend a moment to connect with you on a personal basis. For starters, I have a confession to make. And since I'm in the company of family, I trust that you won't let this uh, embarrassing confession get out, you know. Well, here it is. I am a horrible waiter. Now I'm not talking about the guy or the lady that brings the food to the table. Instead, I'm talking about a person who grows impatient when things that could be handled now seem to draw on for long periods of time. My wife knows that when I pitch an idea for something, no matter how large an impact or how much change is required, I'm ready to move on it at a moment's notice. This is, it kind of works well for our household because I, my wife, she's the more calculated, the overthinker type. And she knows not to even bring up something to me if she's not ready to move on it now. Last week, she showed me a house that she liked on the phone. And within 30 minutes, we were touring it with a realtor and she knew it was time to rein me in before I started negotiating a price and putting an offer down. Simply put, I don't like to wait. I'm not a good waiter. And if I may, I'd like to ask you a question. And please, place your answer in the comments below. Are you a good waiter? I wonder if I'm the only one. Am I the only one who grows impatient at times? Am I the only one who would rather have it now than later? Even though we're physically distant, I feel a sense of like-mindedness here today. I sense that I'm not the only horrible waiter. Now there are two types of periods of waiting. And I tell you, one is much more difficult to endure than the other. There is a definite wait period and conversely an indefinite wait period. Let's start with definite waiting periods. Now these are the easier ones to deal with. Now I'm not saying that they aren't a struggle to cope with, but they are easier since we know that there is a definite end in sight. Are you struggling to wrap your head around this concept? Well, let me give you an example. Did you guys know that on November the 3rd, there was this big deal called an election? And I know if you were hiding under a rock for a few weeks, you may have missed it. But one of the remarkable things about this election was the waiting period that followed. Even though the news agencies and election boards tried to warn us that we wouldn't know the results that night, how many of you all were glued to the TV on an emotional roller coaster as the results began to trickle in? We awoke on the next morning and said, okay, it's a global pandemic, lots of mail-in ballots, and I'll give them a day or two. Then comes November the 4th and November the 5th. And by this time, where I live at, Georgia, we had become one of the swing states at 99%. And I was thinking, how could we count 99% of the votes in a couple of days, but now take a three whole days to count the remaining 1%? Now maybe that was just me. Well, the thing that made this definite waiting period easier to bear is that we know that the 20th Amendment to the Constitution specifies that the term of each elected president of the United States begins at noon on January the 20th of the following year after an election. Maybe you didn't know that, but you Googled it just like I did, just to find out how long this thing could drag on. Either way, 
given the magnitude of what was at stake, it was a struggle to wait until the election was called on the following Saturday. But then there's the other type of waiting period. Now this one is tough, mainly because it's indefinite which means that there is no amendment to the Constitution that ensures its end. As a matter of fact, no one knows. Have you ever struggled waiting for things that have an indefinite end? Are you struggling waiting for the rippling effects of social injustice toward African Americans that have plagued us since we were brought here as slaves in 1619? Have you ever grown impatient when cries for reform or recognition, or at least that we be treated as if we matter continue to go unheard? I'm aware that of many of your personal testimonies by hearing about it through the Black History Month celebrations. I can only imagine how frustrating it can be to watch a new generation voice some of the same cries of outrage that you personally endured and fought for against when you were their age. This type of waiting is tough because it's indefinite. We don't know when permanent change will occur. How about COVID? A global pandemic that has shaken the very fabric of our existence. Do you realize that as of now, Thanksgiving 2020, it has been 260 days since March 11th when the World Health Organization declared COVID-19 a pandemic and things really began to change. 260 days, over 50 million cases and over 1 million deaths, and there is no vaccine that has been released. What makes this period difficult is the fact that there is no definite end date. Every past date that has been predicted has come and it's gone. January 2021 is not looking any more promising than the end of summer of 2020 did. We don't know when this season will end. It's an indefinite waiting period. Now, okay, I've taken long enough of your time without bringing up the scripture that I'd like to share with you. First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, the 16th through the 18th verse. Now, I believe that these three verses provide a solution to the struggle that we all share. Now, no, they will not predict the outcome of the election. No, they won't shed any light as to when social injustice of, or even this pandemic will end. The scriptures are amazing, but they don't lay out timelines for these types of events. But Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, introduces an indefinite waiting period in his letter to the church of Thessalonica. And what we regard now as the fourth chapter in his letter, in the 14th verse, he declares the certainty of this glorious return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He repeats the very words that were spoken by the lips of Christ in verse 15, in stating that not even the pre-existing condition of death will prevent individuals from joining Christ upon his return. In verse 16, he continues with such detail as if he's like outlining the flow of, of a program for the best worship service ever. In verse 16, he says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And verse 17 says, We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, Paul, he anticipates their anxiousness, realizing that they would seek a definite timeline to know exactly how long they would have to wait. But unfortunately, to their dismay, in the first verse of chapter five, Paul reminds them that they already know that he doesn't know when he only knows how it will occur. He likens it to a thief in the night. Nobody expects a thief. Nobody knows when a thief is going to come. And after offering believers some practical guidance of staying ready and loving one another, in the, these three verses that we land on today, he gives keys to transitioning from being a horrible waiter to a good waiter. He says that if you adhere to these three principles, you will in fact be living in alignment with the very will of God concerning your life. Now, that's a pretty bold statement. 
Are you ready for the three things to do during the indefinite waiting periods of your life? Well, 1 Thessalonians 5.16 says, Rejoice evermore. Simply put, we must rejoice while we wait. Don't walk around with your head all down, pouting over your conditions. God has given us so much to rejoice about. While growing up, I loved to watch a television show about this husband and wife who were living in the public housing projects of inner city Chicago. Now over the course of six seasons, 133 episodes, I watched James, Florida, along with their three children, James Jr., Thalma, and Michael endure some of the most difficult situations that life can throw at anybody. But can you imagine what they named this show? If you guessed good times, you're correct. How could they name a show where the plot is saturated with setbacks, good times? Can I tell you? For 133 episodes, they continued to paint the picture that despite our conditions, we all have good times. And that's reason enough to rejoice evermore. Philippians 4, 8 says, And finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Philippians 4, 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Rejoice always. That's the first of the three virtues that will help us wait well. The next verse, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, Pray without ceasing. In a 2020 study, the Barter Group explored various signs of decline and hope among key metrics of faith. In this study, they measured everything from church attendance to Bible reading levels over decades. According to their research, in just the last 10 years, the percentage of Americans who reported praying at least once per week, it has dropped from 85% to 69%. It caused me to wonder, why is prayer on the decline? Well, here's one possibility that I'd like to submit for your consideration. We often view only one aspect of prayer as the only aspect. You know, the asking part. <laughs> prayer is much more than just looking to God and saying, gimme, 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 gimme. If I had to ask someone for the same thing for years, I would grow tired of asking, and I'm sure that that person would grow tired of hearing me. But prayer is so much more. It's a conversation. I found that if I spend time talking to God and sharing my life with God, he begins to reveal to me how he's helping me by not giving me many of the things that are on my wish list. Now, my son, there's a reason why your numbers haven't hit yet. Now, it's not because you haven't prayed for it and even promise to tie 10% of your winnings. If we just talk to God in a transparent and be honest with him and allow him to reveal our imperfections through his word, he'll let you know how ignorant we get if we came into some long green like that. <laughs> Stop just praying for stuff to make us comfortable. Pray to get closer to the Savior. God wants to give us so much more than what we're asking for. If you want to wait well during this indefinite period, first, rejoice always. And second, pray without ceasing. Now, children, they come into this world with nothing. I literally watched our son come out of my wife completely empty handed and completely naked. I can confidently assume that we all arrived here under the same circumstances. From the very moment a child arrives, they need to be provided everything that they have. If they are to make it in this world, somebody's got to give them something. Now, considering that, as soon as children are able to speak in coherent words, we begin to teach them the value of gratitude. As a child runs and snatches something from an adult, 
and turns away without giving a second thought, many times a parent or guardian will, will stop them with these words. Now, what do you say? Now, unfortunately, as we've grown older, we get comfortable with God's kindness and treat him as ungrateful children. We snatch our blessings out of his hand and we don't even give it a second thought. If I could record a personal alarm on everyone's clock, as soon as it starts buzzing and you awake from a night's rest, transitioning from unconsciousness to consciousness, as soon as you're aware and in your right mind, it would say, now what do you say? And the snooze button, it would, it would be disabled. So even after your feet hit the ground, it will repeat, now what do you say? When you open your fridge and find that you've got food to eat, the alarm would keep repeating all throughout the day. Now, what do you say? If you want to wait well, Paul's final teaching to the believers is to be thankful. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Do you want to wait well? Rejoice. Pray. Be thankful. That's it. We don't know when black lives will matter. We don't know when there will be a cure for COVID or when the Lord will return. But in the meantime, God's will for us is to rejoice, is to keep praying, and to be thankful. God bless you. Thank you for having me, and I pray that something that I've said has touched your life. I love you all, Mount Santa Ana.